This is the second workshop in the 2022 New York State World Languages Professional Learning Series. My name is Candace Black and I'm your World Language Associate in the Office of Bilingual Education and World Languages of the New York State Education Department. Welcome to Understanding the Role of Grammar in Proficiency Development, Part 1 of 2. Increasing control of grammatical structures is essential to language proficiency development. Participants in this workshop will first discover how proficiency descriptors for checkpoint proficiency targets and the language functions embedded in each of the New York State Learning Standards for World Languages helps teachers identify which language structures to include in thematic unit design and implementation. Participants will then explore strategies that draw on both implicit and explicit approaches to help learners develop increasing control of grammatical structures. Let's review a few housekeeping details. We have almost 600 pre-registered attendees today, so we ask that you remain muted and that you reserve use of the chat for questions for the presenters or for when the presenters specifically instruct participants to use this feature. If you accidentally get disconnected, just reconnect or call me and I will assist you. My cell is on the confirmation email I sent you yesterday. Bill Heller has very nicely entered into the chat a number of times the link to the handouts folder. We will continue throughout the workshop to repost this. In this folder, you will find the revised standards, themes and topics, proficiency targets and performance indicators, crosswalks, and unit planning templates and exemplars. The PDF of the presentation will be added to this folder at the end of this workshop. Within 24 hours of this event, those who attend this workshop in full, that is after March 3rd, will receive either a certificate of attendance or a certificate documenting CTLE. Because this is a two-part workshop, we will not be sending certificates after the first part, but rather after the second. The type of certificate you will be receiving was indicated in the confirmation email you received after you registered. This workshop is being recorded. The video will be uploaded to the World Languages Professional Learning website within about a week of this event. Those who are unable to attend this live webinar will be able to earn CTLE credit by viewing both workshop videos and answering seven out of 10 questions on a post assessment correctly. Before I introduce our presenters, I'd like to thank the following individuals for their help in assisting with this workshop. Kimberly Harder, Laura Arpey, Barbara Patterson, Eris Thompson, and Yun Xiao Zhang. Our workshop presenters today are Bill Heller, Dr. Joanna O'Toole, and Dr. Lori Langer de Ramirez. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to invite Bill, Joanne, and Lori to begin this workshop. Okay, so this is Joanne, and I'm going to get us started. And Bill, if you take us to the calendar page. There we go. Just a reminder of our upcoming events, as Candy mentioned, today's session is part one of two related to the role of grammar and proficiency development. So Thursday, March 3rd is part two from 4 to 5 p.m. Then at the end of March, understanding standards-based lesson planning. And then in mid-May, May 19th specifically, understanding standards-based curriculum planning. Um, you can register for all of these on the professional learning webpage of the State Ed um, website. And CTLE credits are available for all sessions, and all sessions are recorded. So we look forward to seeing you there. And just a reminder about the New York State World Language Standard Standards Initiative authentic resources wakelet, where we have curated multiple collections of authentic resources by language. And since you last look, I suspect you will find many more resources. Barbara Patterson has continued to enhance this and make it a really useful tool for you. So again, our title slide, Understanding the Role of Grammar in Proficiency Development, Part 1. Let's get started. Our webinar symbols. Again, that reminder to keep yourself muted, keep your microphone on mute. Um, you'll be seeing our thought bubble every once in a while, just inviting you to think. When we ask you to think, please don't enter anything in the chat. Don't unmute yourself. Just use that as an opportunity to consider the prompts that we have offered. 
There will be one time at the very end of the session where we invite you to put your questions in the chat box. We really do ask you to not use the chat box during the session because that way people aren't distracted as the chat pops up. Um, and then there'll be one place where we have our Google folder icon. Again, Bill has been putting that link in the chat. And just to indicate that one of the resources we will be sharing on the screen is found in that folder. And again, our presentation slides will be in the folder after today's session. So we have three goals, but I need you to know that these three goals are the goals not only for today, but also for the second session, which will be held next week. And some of these goals are going to be fully addressed today. Some aren't barely addressed today and will be more fully addressed in the next session. So what are these goals? First, I can understand the role of grammar in the standards and checkpoint proficiency targets. Secondly, I can apply strategies for teaching grammar in standards-based instruction. And finally, I can understand the role that implicit and explicit instructional strategies play in the learning of grammar. So many questions. I suspect as you came today, you may have many, many questions about your own grammar instruction in mind, ones you hope to have answered. Some of those might be the ones that we've been thinking about, such as, what grammar should I include? When do I introduce new grammar? How much do I introduce at once? How do I introduce new grammar? Or even, in what order do I present key grammar structures? Again, our goal is by the end of both sessions, these questions will be answered. So to get us started, I wanna make sure that we have a shared definition for two key terms. The first one is language function. For those of you who have been attending these sessions all the way along, you're gonna say, oh, we define that every single time we meet. That's all good. But some of you may be new today to attending our sessions. So what is a language function? It is the communicative purpose of a given task. For example, giving advice, telling a story, expressing an opinion. The other key term is language forms. We actually saw this term in our last session on vocabulary, and that's because the term language forms refers to both vocabulary and grammar. So because our focus today is on grammar, then the wording in red is what we want to pay closest attention to. So language form, the structure or way of organizing language, the grammar as well as essential vocabulary that serve a particular language function. Keep that idea in mind that language forms, vocabulary and grammar are in service to language functions, which of course are our purposes for communication. So as many of you know, in 2016, ACTFL, our national professional organization introduced what they referred to as core practices for world language learning. Core practices are research-based strategies for effectively developing students' language proficiency. And on this chart that ACTFL created, there are six core practices. They say it's not a complete list, but Number five on this list happens to be teach grammar as concept and use in context. So those are big guiding ideas to the work that we'll be presenting to you. And on the ACTFL website, and Bill, you can go to the next slide, 
For each one of these core practices, Actful has answered three questions. They say, what is it? Why do it? And how, do, how should we do it? So in terms of the what, teaching grammar as a concept and using it in context really frames grammar as an element of proficiency and of communication. Why do it? Well, the first big idea is that meaning is expressed through form. And so meaning first, and then the form in support of it or service of it. And then the other why is that the research shows certain things about language acquisition that I didn't put on this slide because we're going to be exploring that throughout our sessions, particularly in session two. And how should this be done? Well, that's what this webinar and the next one are all about. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Lori. Thank you so much, Joanne. So those questions really resonate with me as well. And what I'd like to share with you next are um, some ideas, some uh, examples of how I am making this transition from the way I learn grammar as a, a second language learner to uh, teaching grammar as a concept. So we'll start by um, looking at this particular idea. I used to, when I started teaching, begin with present, practice, and produce. As I learned a little more, I started to move towards the idea of beginning with input and moving towards output, beginning with the implicit and moving towards explicit. And I'll give you an example of what this looks like in my classroom. So this is a song that I love to use with my students. It's fairly old now, but it still does the trick. It is called Ingredientes or Ingredients by JD Natasha. She is Cuban American um, and it's a really catchy tune. So we use this as input with my students. Um, and what we're really going to focus in on is a particular section of this song. So this section is um, really focusing in on uh, desires, the, the singers, uh, the singer songwriters desires. And uh, for those of you who don't speak Spanish or know Spanish, it says, in order to fly, you need wings. In order to dream, you need a dream. In order to love, you need a heart. And this of course resonates with my adolescent uh, students quite well. So we're beginning with this song as input and we're focusing on the structure para, in order to, plus infinitive, to say, in order to, right? So the language function we're going to focus on here is stating opinions and making observations. Again, we have the input. We're looking at this particular structure. And for output, I have students working with this scaffolded uh, graphic organizer. Again, they're going to state opinions and make observations. I have the language scaffolded for them and they're going to write their own version of this particular line or lines in the song. We all want to do something. And in order to do that thing, you need this other thing. So again, an example of input toward output and looking at the implicit and moving towards explicit language. Another example to share with you. I used to start with the rules. Oh, many of us got into this profession because that's what makes sense, the rules. But now I am moving towards starting with the meaning, having students find patterns, and then consolidating these patterns using graphic organizers or anchor charts. So another example comes from this book, which I absolutely adore. Those of you who know me know I have a particular fascination with the capybara. This is a book called Los Carpinchos or the Capybaras from Ediciones de Care in Venezuela. It's a fantastic story about these, these capybaras who are looking for a home and they come across these chickens and the chickens are gonna let them stay, but they have some rules. And so in reading this, we focus on these particular rules 
that show up on the top right. And again, I'll share with you what those mean. The rules are don't make noise, don't come out of the water, don't come near the food. I think that one's a good one. And don't question the rules. Fantastic. So you can imagine again, our adolescent students, our novice students are really compelled um, kind of looking at these rules and unpacking them. The language function we're going to focus on here is telling someone what to do. So through the story, we're going to focus on the meaning rather than the grammar itself. Then we're looking at the patterns and I ask students to think, well, how, how are these rules constructed? What do you need to make a rule? And they quickly picked out that there is a, the no for the negative rule, no, and it seems like an infinitive, fantastic. So then if that's the way to make the negative, we ask, how do you get to the affirmative command or telling someone what to do as opposed to what not to do? And they correctly figured out that you just take the no away. Now, what's great about these particular rules is this is a very simple way of doing commands in Spanish. It is a checkpoint A way of doing commands in Spanish. And this is something that my students can handle at this proficiency level. So again, using this graphic organizer, they're noticing the negative patterns, they're guessing at the affirmative. And then we move from the input of the story to output. And I ask students to design class rules and that they did indeed and came up with a better set of rules than I could have given them. Um, and we actually periodically review these rules to make sure that they are still good, that they still apply and students make tweaks and changes throughout the year. So again, an example of moving from, um, ex from uh, explicit to implicit, uh, implicit to explicit, um, moving from that input of a great story to uh, the output in creating their own rules. I used to introduce conjugation groups separately. And I remember those uh, packs of stem changing verbs. That was my whole unit. Or we'd look at the irregulars or the regulars. So I've moved away from that to introducing persons separately and introducing verbs relevant to the task. So really breaking up the need to give all of the things together and looking at meaning as the driving principle. So here's what that looks like in my classroom. This is a collection of these incredible illustrations or memes by Colombian uh, graphic artist, Oscar Ospina. They are really fantastic, kids love them. And it's all about monsters. So these monsters are doing lots of different things. Um, and we're using this as input, an interpretive reading task. Then I'm gonna focus in on three in particular. Um, and you will notice um, those of you who speak Spanish that these are um, reflexive verbs and they really refer to habitual actions. So these three mean um, monsters also shave, they paint their nails, and they straighten their hair. So in an interpersonal speaking task, students are going to brainstorm what students also do, right? And their presentational language function is narration of habitual actions. And we're going to see that students come up with a list of things that they also do. So we're really focusing in on that third person plural and looking at the meaning that comes from these particular images and the text that comes along with them. What else? I used to, go ahead, Bill, next slide, suspense, design exercises that focus on mechanical manipulation of forms. I remember doing my Spanish homework without paying much attention while watching TV because you could recognize patterns and fill in blanks. And that's something that I used to organize for my students as well, that type of a task. And now I've moved towards designing contextualized activities and tasks that connect forms and meaning. So let's have a look at what this looks like. Another thing I love to do in my classes is take fantasy trips and we do them frequently. 
This infographic is one that we've used throughout the year to take trips to different parts of the Spanish speaking world. It is an authentic material from despegar.com, which is a Latin American travel outfit. Um, and it's a wonderful way for students to figure out what the weather is in different parts of the world and what folks wear. So they'll use this information um, and read it as an interpretive reading activity. And then for a homework task, I asked them to pack their bags to get ready to travel to wherever it is that we're traveling to based on the information they glean from the weather in that part of the world. I use a file folder for this. It's a great way to have a, their individual suitcases. They fill it with images that could be clip art um, of all the different clothing that they're going to bring with them. And like any good homework task, this homework task is going to be used the very next day for another task. So they bring in their suitcases and they will sit opposite each other, much like the battleship game, so they can't see each other's suitcase. And they're going to exchange information. So the speaking, uh, the language function here, as I said, is exchanging information. And they're going to exchange information about what they've packed. The sentence starters on the page that you see in front of you use different forms of the verb tener. So we are giving them and scaffolding that language for them. And they're going to ask each other what they have in their suitcase. And they might respond, I have this, I don't have that. Um, and then they're going to fill in this chart with the clothing that they have in common, things that they have that are different. And then they're going to talk about what they have that is similar and different. So we're exchanging information in this task. I used to focus my lessons on linguistic structures, negatives, the avoir idioms, por and para. And now I focus lessons on language functions. You've heard many language functions referred to in these examples. The next batch of authentic materials also comes from a, a graphic artist from Colombia. It is from Wawa Wiwa, which is lots of fun to say. It's a collection of memes that I think are hysterical, but I wanna enlist my students' opinions here and get a sense for what they think. So we're going to focus in on one in particular. And this one, one fish says to the other, what can I do here? And the other fish says nothing or swim, depending on how you interpret this very funny meme in my humble opinion. So I'm going to ask them to exchange opinions about this particular material. They're going to talk to each other and give their opinion as to whether they think uh, it's funny because, or more likely than not, they're gonna say it's not funny because, or if they really don't like it, they're gonna say it's a dad joke because and that takes it to the next level. So here they're exchanging opinions, but the, the grammar undergirding this language function is the verb ser or to be plus adjective plus uh, because, por qué. So we're looking at syntax here. But again, as Joanne mentioned, this is all in the service of the language or communicative function. Okay have uh, another one here to share with you. I used to organize my curriculum by a sequence of grammar topics. We all have. Um, and now I'm really moving towards organizing my curriculum by themes that purposefully sequence and spiral those language functions that we just talked about. So this last example I'll share with you is uh, related to our unit on the Day of the Dead. Students are creating ofrendas or altars or offerings to someone who has passed. It could be a pet, as you see on the left. It could be a family member, as the example on the right. And we'll see in the next slide in a minute, um, somebody famous who has passed away. So they create their ofrenda and they come in to class um, and they need to explain their ofrenda. So again, these are checkpoint A, these are novice students. Um, and so there's a lot of scaffolding in this, um, in this card that they get to help them to communicate about their ofrenda. And on the card, they have to say, this is my ofrenda to whoever the person is or the pet. And we're looking at one area I want them to know is 
that person liked, but they don't necessarily have this past tense yet. And so I'm giving it to them. The person used to like or liked in the past, and they're going to make a list of things that are on that ofrenda. And then because of that, on my ofrenda, I, there are, there is or there are the following items. And this is something I very much want them to know and to be able to use. And then at the very end, we have this offering or this ofrenda was made by, and they have to put their name. And of course that structure they don't know, so it is scaffolded there for them. As the students are presenting, it's always important to get the other students engaged and involved. And so they're listening and they're going to vote on their favorite ofrenda. And here we have, again, that spiraled language. We're using uh, me gusta, again. In this case, I do expect them to be able to control that language. So I like this offering because, and then we have all of the different reasons why they might like that offering. And that noun adjective agreement is controlled for, right? It's all there, they're just checking off, but it's really presenting it to them so that they can um, interact with this text and respond to the ofrendas that are being shared with them. That ofrenda is Babe Ruth, I believe, which is really great. So here Gustav comes in again and we're spiraling back. So all of these examples to give you um, the, some takeaways, some guiding principles from um, what I've shared. And so principle one, focus on, start with those language functions. You've heard me repeat over and over again, the language function is where you really wanna start. What are students doing with that language? Principle two, know your proficiency target. Have a good sense for what students are able to do at all these different proficiencies. And principle three, move from input to output. We saw many examples of input and authentic materials and then asking students to do something after having interpreted those materials. So you're going to see these examples pop up again. As we just said, spiraling is important. So they will be spiraled back in a lot of what Joanne and Bill have to comment on later in this session. Um, and with that, I turn it over to Joanne who will talk to us about what the revised New York State standards say about grammar. Thank you, Laurie. So going back to the standards, really the purpose for which we're doing all of this work, um, we want to ask, what do the communication standards say about grammar? So let's take a look. Wait a minute. Those are language functions. Let's look at the culture standards. What do they say about grammar? Language functions again. So the key understanding that I hope you can take away here is that our standards remind us that communication, whether we're dealing with communication for communication's sake, communication within a cultural context, really focuses on what students can do with language, the language functions. Grammar is not mentioned in any explicit way in the standards. Instead, we as teachers need to make decisions about what grammatical structures will support our students' ability to carry out the language functions, thus carrying out this, the revised standards. So what does proficiency tell us about grammar? So remember, proficiency is how well at a given level, students can perform with language. And so this first slide is about novice level proficiency. And speaking, we see this, this message. This is a quote right from the actual proficiency guidelines. Communicate short messages through the use of isolated words and phrases that have been encountered, memorized, and recalled. And in writing, words and phrases provide limited formulaic information. So I want to point out a couple things. First of all, the words in italics communicate short messages, provide information. Those are the language functions again. And so you'll see that the wording around the grammar is embedded 
basically in the discussion of how well students can carry out and how students can carry out the language functions. But the novice level, which is checkpoint A for all of our languages, clearly doesn't differentiate grammar and vocabulary. And we've talked about that before in our vocabulary session, that notion of the formulaic chunks, the functional chunks, the expressions, the words, the phrases that our students learn in order to communicate that may have grammar embedded in them, but that really go unanalyzed at the novice level. Let's take a look at intermediate level proficiency and what that has to say. Speaking, recombine learned material to express personal meaning, typically in present time. And for writing, create with a language to communicate simple facts and ideas, primarily in present time. So again, we see that marriage between language functions and forms, but we now see the first mention of what we typically think about when we think about grammar. Present time, present tense, that's what we're looking for students to be able to do at the intermediate level of proficiency. Intermediate level, checkpoints B and C. And then at the advanced level, speaking, narration and description in the major time frames of past, present, and future, and sufficient control of basic structures. Writing, narrate and describe in the major time frames of past, present, and future, show good control of the most frequently used structures. So a few things to pay attention to. First off, our language functions, narrate and describe. We have more extended explanation of what grammar um, our students should be able to carry out at the advanced level. We have the time frames of past, present, and future. But this is also the first time that the mention of control comes into place and sufficient control. So that whole notion of accuracy, the accuracy with which we expect students to um, employ the grammar is only at the advanced level with sufficient control of basic structures. And you may be wondering why I've included advanced proficiency, because our checkpoints A, B, and C are pegged to novice and intermediate levels. Well, for a few reasons. One is that students who are at that intermediate high level are at least 50% of the time performing at the advanced low level. Secondly, when our students are at that advanced level, we have that comfort and stretch that Bill's going to talk about a little bit later, where we want to stretch them into that next proficiency level. And of course, we have early start programs that may well get our students into the advanced level, and we have heritage speakers who may be at that advanced level as well. But I want to make one last comment about proficiency which is you'll notice that I only mentioned speaking and writing here. And does grammar play a role in listening, reading, viewing? It does in terms of students' interpretation of a text. However, for our purposes and the purposes of these two sessions, our focus is really going to be on students' grammatical output, which will be through speaking and writing in the in interpersonal, and presentational modes of communication, standards two and three. So I'm going to pass it off to Bill. Thank you, Joanne. As Joanne just pointed out, proficiency guidelines give us some guidance about how we uh, put grammatical accuracy in its proper perspective. In proficiency-based teaching, Grammatical accuracy is understood in terms of increasing degrees of control over grammatical structures. When we first introduce a new structure, learners might recognize its meaning and context, but will only produce it with a lot of scaffolding. At this point, they have what we call conceptual control. As learners see structures in, 
uh, used in different contexts and have additional opportunities to use this structure with less scaffolding, we can say they develop partial control. Full control then is when learners can recognize and use a structure in a variety of contexts with little or no scaffolding and increasing levels of automaticity. As indicated in the proficiency guidelines, full control of present time is achieved in the intermediate level. Full control of major time frames is a hallmark of advanced proficiency and will also be evidenced at the intermediate high level. As Meg I'm sorry, I've been muted this whole time. I apologize. I just noticed that. Um, was I muted the whole time or? You were just muted when you started to read the quote. Okay, thanks. I just must have picked the wrong thing. Thank you. So students don't move. Uh, so the quote from Meg Malone, who is an actful OPI trainer, she says, students don't move automatically from understanding how a concept works to functional ability. It takes time and repeated practice in a variety of contexts before students will internalize a concept and be able to produce it spontaneously. Over time, they will develop different degrees of control over a concept. Let's see what that looks like for several of our language functions. Let's start with the interpersonal language function, exchange information. At checkpoint A, most of the grammatical content consists of memorized words, phrases, questions, and answers. What is your name? What is your birthday? Where do you live? We also begin to develop a conceptual understanding of the patterns for question formation and how, ch uh, how changes in form affect meaning in the present tense verb forms or markers to indicate, for example, whether I'm talking about myself or whether I'm talking about somebody else. So we see here we've got um, full control of memorized questions and answers, partial control of single question words, and conceptual control at this point of, of question formation in the present tense. When we advance to checkpoint B, we see our level of control. We see the same structures. But now, in order to have intermediate proficiency, learners demonstrate full control of question formation. In addition, we see control of the present tense increase to partial. And we might be introducing command forms to give directions and develop a conceptual control over those structures. And then finally, at checkpoint uh, C, learners will have full control of making questions and using the present tense and will develop partial control using various command forms. We can look at the presentational function of describe. At checkpoint A, with lots of practice, with high frequency verb to be, in a variety of contexts, learners can attain partial control of this basic form. They can also develop a conceptual control of the use, positioning, and agreement of adjectives. At checkpoint B, our learners progress and they develop full control of to be in the present tenses and gain con partial control of the position and agreement of adjectives, requiring less scaffolding and prompts. And then at checkpoint C, they're developing full and consistent control of these grammatical structures. So in this task Lori presented, her students develop class rules to carry out the language function of telling somebody what to do using the infinitive or the negative infinitive as a command form. At this level, learners can easily navigate this structure with partial control with minor scaffolding. In this task, Lori allows the students to show their control of the basic structure I in Spanish, which means there is, there are, similar to the structure Ilia in French or Esquipt in German. This is a high frequency structure, so students can begin to show partial control of its use where she also presents two other grammatical structures as language chunks. She uses the past form of the verb gustar to like to tell how the ofrenda represented what the person's uh, what the person liked in this life. The whole past tense isn't presented at this time, but this one formulaic chunk builds a conceptual level of understanding in context. 
The same is used for the passive voice in the last line. It is presented as a one-time use chunk, laying a conceptual foundation for a later understanding of the passive voice. So as teachers, our challenge is to give our students the opportunity to increase control of the structures they've already seen and to maintain those structures and develop increasing automaticity. At the same time, if our learners are conti to continue to progress and increase their level of proficiency, we need to be cognizant of introducing and practicing new structures to expand the range of their communicative possibilities. Meg Malone calls this notion comfort and stretch. She says, instructors need to target instruction across two ranges, broadening learners' performance at their current range and working to develop some abilities at the next higher range. Let's see what this might look like at each checkpoint. So at checkpoint A, the comfort level is going to be with basic vocabulary, memorized expressions, formulaic language, answering basic questions. To stretch them to the next level, we're going to be stretching them to use present tense forms, to be more aware of, of uh, partial control of present tense, of noun adjective agreement, and asking questions. And then we'll be occasionally providing some conceptual um, opportunities uh, to develop conceptual control of things that are going to be coming attractions. The idea of the conjugated verb from a plus infinitive, for example, reflexive verbs, simple future and simple past. We'll give those as language chunks to develop some conceptual control. At checkpoint B level, in their comfort range will be the present tense, noun adjective agreement, asking questions. And we'll be redoing these, reintroducing these structures, practicing them in a variety of contexts. To stretch them to the next level, we'll be going to things like conjugated verb plus infinitive, reflexive verbs, near and future and recent past. And then in the coming attractions, we'll be planting the seeds with conceptual control of command forms, object pronouns, uh, simple past, narration and description, use of the imperfect, We'll be developing just basic conceptual control of these structures. And then at checkpoint C, what was um, partial control starts to become full control. These are in the comfort zone now of our learners. The present tense, noun adjective agreement, asking questions, conjugated verb plus infinitive, near future, recent past, reflexive verbs. These are all in their comfort zone. We're stretching them to use command forms, object pronouns, simple past, narration and description, and the imperfect. They'll show partial control of these structures. And then we'll be starting to see conceptual control of things like the subjunctive, the conditional, expressing and defending opinions, hypothetical situations, which we would present it to them at checkpoint C in highly scaffolded form formats. Lori shared a great example of the principle of comfort and stretch. In, exam in analyzing her humorous memes, she gave her students sentence starters that used the familiar verb and some cognates. This is well within the comfort zone of her students. At the same time, we see the element of stretch because she adds the conjunction because and encourages the learners to expand their responses and create with the language. Creating with language and co using complete sentences are necessary characteristics for her students to be able to advance to the intermediate level of proficiency. So this shows us a great example of comfort and then stretch. And now uh, I believe Joanne picks it up here. So it's back to me and you'll see our thought bubble because at this point in time, we invite you to just think about these questions. Which ones have been answered for you? Which ones maybe you have partial answer to? Which ones are you still waiting to have answers to that will come in our next session? Again, in what order do I present key grammar structures? When do I introduce new grammar? What grammar should I include? How do I introduce new grammar? How much do I introduce at once? 
So just asking you to think about these questions for a moment. And Bill, let's go on to today's goals, or not today's goals, the goals for the two sessions. So just revisiting our goals, I can identify the role of grammar in the standards and checkpoint proficiency targets. So we really address this quite fully in today's session. I can apply strategies for teaching grammar in standards-based instruction. You saw many examples of how Lori does that. You'll see many more examples in our next session. I can understand the role that implicit and explicit instructional strategies play in the learning of grammar. Again, Lori's examples referred to this, and in our next session, you will see this in much more depth. So at this point in time, we invite you to put questions you may have in the chat, but I would invite you to ask questions relevant to the content of today's session, because again, we're going to take it much, much further um, when we come to our next session. And I do want to point out that today um, we've been able to conclude before the five o'clock hour and offer you much time for question and answer. In our next session, it's pretty robust. So plan for the full hour of content. So um, go ahead and put your questions in the chat box. I see someone has their hand raised. I'm going to ask you to put your question in the chat. And then um, I will have Lori offer questions that she's observing. And we will start from there. Thank you, Joanne. Lots of good questions coming into the chat. Uh, so uh, one question about whether there's a document created that shows which formulaic expressions there are for each function and for each proficiency level. So I don't think that there are formulaic expressions that are out there for you to use, but rather you can determine what chunks of language are useful to your students to communicate in a given context um, at a given proficiency level. So for example, in a checkpoint A um, context where students are talking about their identity, you might teach them how to say their name, how to talk about their birthday, how to identify members of a family, but teach them how to say that just as a chunk. So for example, in Spanish, uh, me llamo, my name is, they don't have to know that that's present tense of the verb llamarse in the first person using a reflexive verb. They don't need to know that. You just teach it to them as that chunk. So it's really up to you in that context with that function to determine what the appropriate chunks are that you want to teach them for them to be able to carry out those language functions. Thank you, Joanne. Um, I'll ask a, another question, and I think this might be on the minds of many, um, a question about teaching the old way, quote unquote, um, for many, many years, and um, really wanting to understand how to begin. So how do we start moving towards the input to output um, idea? You know what, I love Bill to field that question. Okay, <laughs> I can see Somehow that. Somehow he's the philosopher here. I think that he's going to get us started. I think for me, um, as someone who's old and um, has you know been around for a while and taught many of these ways, um, you know, be, like I was taught the grammar, um, it's just a matter of trying to. Um, just doing it, you know, you learn to play the violin by playing the violin, you learn to swim by swimming, uh, you learn to do something the new way by doing it the new way and making mistakes and um, we're all about kind of giving our kids grace to make mistakes and that understanding that is part of language learning it's part of language teaching as well. So, um, I, I think what after 
trying just trying to take some of these strategies that that you hear us using and say you know i might want to try that one just start with one uh you're going to hear in the next session about three approaches that we're going to talk about and you might say okay i want to try this approach i think i can do this for one lesson and see how it goes and see if it doesn't make uh, more sense i think for me um the understanding of um proficiency levels and then the understanding of language functions and then keying my learning into language functions instead of bloom's verbs but but uh, but grabbing onto those language functions cleared the way for me to understand okay what structures do i need for them to do this there was a there is a question in the box about is there a master list of what functions go with each checkpoint the thing is all the functions go with all the checkpoints you can do in a, an intellectually honest way of every language function at every checkpoint it's just that you do it in a different way and you're going to do it in increasing levels of sophistication as you go on through so just trying to figure out clearing away the clutter like our the book with the two on it has so much grammar in it that we don't need and we just have to pick out what do i need for this language function that's all i need to present it right now that's all i need my learners to focus on and and then really do it well and um give lots of rich input point out those patterns as you and you'll see you'll see that in the next uh session how we do that in some using some very specific um, techniques and i'll add to what bill said in that let the standards be your guide standard number one is interpretive communication and interpretive communication takes place by viewing listening reading and so when you start with that standard you're starting with input Input. And the given input you choose will have related to it um, language functions um, and language structures. And so that can be your real starting place. Lori, this is such an important question. I want to make sure that we've answered it robustly. Yeah, I, I will definitely add to that. I, I also think um, Bill alluded to the idea of just do one task, just start with one task. I think oftentimes we get very bogged down in new ideas and we feel like, oh no, I have to overhaul everything that I'm doing, but you'll never start if you get overwhelmed with it. So start with one, maybe one thematic unit, one lesson, a, a task that you would like to overhaul as um, Bill and Joanne said, focus on language function. What is it that students need to be able to do with this language? So not the grammar first, but the function first, right? And that's going to start to change the perspective of, of a particular task or a group of tasks. Um, I also love what Joanne just said about the interpretive mode, really finding materials that are just amazing. Uh, I am constantly on the lookout for materials. I never stop looking for materials. Um, at folks share. I think that's there's a wealth of uh, materials out there, authentic materials that you can use. Once you find really viable authentic materials, create some kind of good storage system for yourself so you can find them, tag them, label them, and you'll always have things to work with. Those wonderful materials that you saw that I shared earlier really help to inspire and connect to language functions in, in playful ways and fun ways. And it becomes um, quite an enjoyable task, but start, start small. So Bill, what are some questions that you see? Yeah, there's some really good, really good questions. Um, one of them is about writing objectives to um, the learning targets. Like, um, I'll just read it. I'm out of state transplant. Uh, I was always taught that our unit daily targets should not explicitly state the grammar, uh, but rather the language function. I can describe activities from my childhood rather than I can use the imperfect. But I'm getting administrative push pushback at my school. Where does that fall in the New York State proficiency-based standards? And I, I think uh, Joanne, you have a perfect answer for this one. So, our our revised standards expect you to write the um, learning targets with I can, with the language function, with the context. So you're all set in regard to the way you're writing it but then you can add the word using and then follow that 
with the structure that they're doing it with. So I can describe daily activities. I can describe as a language function, context as daily activities using the imperfect tense. And when you write your learning targets in that way, then it really makes clear that the language structure or grammar is in service to the um, function, which is contextualized. Here's another really good one. Um, from today's presentation, it appears that checkpoints A and B focus primarily on the present tense. The present day rubric for checkpoint B writing, for example, states that the students are able to express themselves in past, present, and future as appropriate. Will this be changing? I'm, I'm misinterpreting this. So I think you're referring to the rubrics that accompanied the um, the regents exams. The regents exams, the second language proficiency exams. And so clearly, as the standards change, the rubrics that um, accompany them will change. That said, uh, so my expectation is that that probably will not be part of that. Um, but that said, students can communicate about the past and about the future, even without having control or even necessarily knowledge of those language structures. So, for example, if I say yesterday I go, yesterday has indicated that it was in the past. But my guess is that we're not going that direction, that we'll be shifting from that. Right. And we're at checkpoint B. We're still we're give, we're starting to develop that control it, because they're going to be intermediates in the stretch. So we are developing that idea of time in checkpoint B. It's just that the level of control that they're going to have without scaffolding is going to be less. And uh, we can do, they could do very simple things like to have just done something or going to do something that's expressing future and past time with very simple structures that are easily accessible to checkpoint A learner or checkpoint B learners. So there are there are ways to still do that. But as Joanne said, the rubrics will be re-examined to align with the new expectations. Lori, what questions are you seeing? Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of questions about authentic resources again, and I, I really want to address that. So questions where to find them, that we're taking a lot of time finding resources. Um, I will tell you what I do. Um, I, as I said, I'm, I'm constantly on the lookout. There's never a time I'm not, you know, looking at something and thinking, could I use this? I pick up newspapers, I pick up magazines, um, I look online. It's a great excuse to be online and on Facebook. So I'm actually doing work. So, and so lots of sharing is going on as well on these sites. Um, I would really recommend that you crowdsource. No, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Things that I find can be shared. Um, please have a look at the Wakelet. That's what it's there for. There are lots of incredible resources and also um, all over uh, Facebook and Pinterest you can share and, and look with your colleagues at school. Share some of that work and share some of those resources. And once you find them, grab them keep them somewhere. Um, don't expect uh, sometimes things disappear online. So I always make sure that I download things and make sure that you have the reference to where you originally found them so that you can do your, um, your citing and be responsible in that way. But always, you know, always be on the lookout. Um, another question was can, about- Can I add to that, Laurie? Yeah. Well, please go ahead. So I know that some of you on this call are part of a project that's uh, underway right now. We have close to 300 teachers in New York State who are developing unit plan exemplars. And every one of those unit plan exemplars has several authentic resources built into it. And they're across topics and across languages. And we hope to have them available to you around June. And so that will be another source of authentic resources that have already been connected to a given unit context. And, and I just want to add to that, sorry, Joanne, um, because one of the questions is about the Spanish centric nature of some of these examples. And we have been very transparent about that as three uh, Spanish teachers. Um, this is what we have. This comes directly out of my classroom that I'm in every day. So um, those are the examples we bring to you. But as Joanne said, we have an incredible 
incredible group of educators from all over New York State working on um, materials in other languages as well. So, um, you know, again, that's the, the nature of, of what we do and what we bring to this work. Um, and we encourage everyone else to, to share. And, and we, of course, will be um, hoping to help you with that by collecting materials and collecting these great exemplars. Along with that idea about the um, how each language has to kind of decide what is comfort and what is stretch at each checkpoint for their language. Um, that's something that you look at the language function, you say, okay, they could do the language function, what do they start with, what can they push, I, you know, push to next, what can you push to next. Some structures, for example, command structures are much easier than in French, some of them are than in Spanish. Whereas, you know, you have to worry about, um, you know, agreement of participles in French that you don't have to worry about in Spanish. So um, each language is going to have its own quirks as to what will be uh, um, able to be acquired quickly and easily and what will take some more time and practice, what's going to go to the um, you know to the the higher levels of proficiency but but if, the, if you keep the idea of concept moving from conceptual control of any structure to partial control to full control i think that's a helpful mindset to maintain regardless of the quirks of your language any other outstanding questions there well i think we're at five o'clock if we want to oh. just let people Absolutely. So, no. so let's do that. It is five o'clock and this is what you've committed to. So we want to thank those of you who need to log off at five o'clock for being here. We look forward to seeing you next week. We will stay on for people who want to continue to ask and answer questions. And so we invite you to do that. So Bill, is there another question you want to put forward for those people who are staying on? Well, I just uploaded the, I just am uploading the slides. So you'll have access to the slides immediately. Um, no, I haven't, I'm not seeing, I haven't, I was talking, so I wasn't reading the questions. Okay, so <laughs> Lori? Yes, yeah, so um, I am, somebody was asking how I made the emoji worksheet. So um, this is another thing that I, I love to suggest um, crowdsourcing. Everyone has different talents and skills. I have colleagues who are amazing at certain things and they're the ones who work up um, Excel, for example. I hate Excel. So th they're really good at that and I, I rely on them for that. I am really fond of kind of graphics and making things look a certain way. So that's that's my skill and it might, might not be everybody. So, you know, look for colleagues and um, share some of this work. Um, both, as I said, finding of the materials, but also creating the, the materials that are student facing. Um, I find that it makes a difference uh, when students can really relate to what's in front of them and they find it humorous or they find it engaging, um, it, it helps. Um, so, you know, uh, work with your colleagues to, to make wonderful things. One thing I'm seeing, like in a couple of questions is embedded the idea that we're going to actually publish a list somewhere and that's not going to happen. We're not going to be publishing a list of what what grammar structures go with what checkpoint um, or even with what function. Now there is, a we do have a list of language functions that go with the standards, but we don't have a list of what standards, what all the language functions go with all the checkpoints and it's up to the the teachers of the language to decide what the structures they need to enact those um, functions are necessary and at what level they'll expect their students to be performing them at each checkpoint. I mean, ultimately, the assessment of student learning will be an assessment of their ability to carry out the standards. And as we saw, the standards do not embed grammatical structures. The standards embed language functions, but proficiency tells us they should be doing it with greater control, with greater um, sophistication, and across time frames as they move up the proficiency levels. So that's what needs to be our guide. All right, I think at this point we will just 
um, anybody who's still on who has a question that's not answered, if they would like to um, raise a hand or mute yourselves, there's only a few of you left, we'll take those questions. Um, otherwise, I believe we are all set and we thank you so much for being here today. Laura, go ahead. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, the chat was disabled for me, so I couldn't type this in. Um, Lori, my question is for you. You mentioned making the changes to your curriculum, and I was just curious to know how long that took you to go from the way things used to be um, to how you're doing them now. And also, what do you do to make sure, um, you know, if you're working with other people in your department, that you're still meeting all of those language functions from one level to the next? That is a phenomenal question. And so I will say that it started slowly um, and, and grew with my understanding of language functions and our standards. Once I got a better grip on kind of the theoretical underpinnings of all of this, it just started moving a lot faster. So it's going to, it might feel glacial at the start. And I'm, I'm sensing that in a lot of the, the comments about feeling frustrated and overwhelmed, and that's really normal. And I felt the same way. Um, once you start doing it and you start seeing it in action, and then you create a few more tasks and they start to work and it's making more sense, it becomes a lot more intuitive. And then you're, you're kind of on the road and it, it moves a lot quicker. And so that's something to look forward to. With regard to, I think you're asking about articulation and connecting to the colleagues in the department. And so that's a broader departmental conversation to have. Um, and so things that I've worked on with our own department is um, philosophical statements. So a, a statements about essential agreements as to what we agree we will be doing in the classroom, those kinds of conversations can help unstick um, folks if folks are in different places as most of our departments are. Um, and so that's, that's a broader um, kind of project to work on, but one that's really important. I will add that our session in May on curriculum development will be a critical piece to that conversation. We will give you tools and um, we will give you suggestions that you can bring back to your department. And again, the Uniplan exemplars that are being developed may be really useful for starting to frame out um, some of the changes. Um, sorry, just to piggyback off of that, speaking of those unit plan exemplars, I know that I did not apply because I could not commit um, to every single session. Is it okay to like still come in and help and also to get an idea or do you want it strictly the people that have um, been approved to work on those? So it's for the people who have been approved who can attend all okay. sessions. But that said, if you are teaching, for example, at Checkpoint B or C or mm -hmm. FLES or heritage levels or heritage speakers, we will be having other um, okay. sessions in the future. Okay, thank you so much, everybody. Laura, I also want to mention that we are having some summer collaborative unit design True. workshops in oh. each region. They're free. Okay. Um, it's, it's different from the vetted ones, but it'll be an opportunity for you to get together and work with other teachers in your region of the same language to do a similar process. Perfect. Thank you. That's exactly what I'm looking for. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate everything that you are doing. Thank you. You are very welcome. Thank you.